good evening, everybody. And I hope that your day is off to a great start. Hello. Come on and come in and let's prepare to have a discussion to this evening. I love all of you. Thank you so much for spending time with me. Hello, first time and welcome you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Amen. It was great prayer last night, wasn't it? Hello, first timers. Got a couple of first timers in. God bless. God bless you. Um, come in. Let's talk. This is going to be good. I love you as well, Rob Rush. Um, and let's share some things. And it's going to be amazing. Yes, intercessory prayer was off the chain. Isaac, I was so proud of you. My wife told me you was beasting this morning on your Q&A. Hey, my honey bunny. I love you. And that was for my wife, by the way. I saw her send me hearts, just to clarify. Uh, this is an Izzy Sparkling Water Beverage. So any of you alcoholics out there are not tempted to accuse me of causing you to stumble. This is not a wine cooler. Even when I was a drunk, uh, wine coolers didn't do the job. So uh, this is more appropriate. Hey, Mr. James. Yeah, I took your drink because I pay the rent. Hey, Prophet Darius, I love you. So, yeah, um, this is water, guys. Just want to clarify that. Um, Hey, Bishop Jordan, I miss you too. Let's get ready to do some work. Everybody knows I have been a uh, Adrian Davis. I'm just um, blunt. I don't I don't be trying to be funny. It just kind of comes off that way. Um, I've been in a three-part, uh, three-day teaching series on the subject of lust and ministering to people who deal or struggle in their sexual character. And um, it is something that's very important. Um, hey, Clack, and I might keep going, depends on where my flow is. I'm getting ready for a big weekend. I'm spending time with all of my leaders, my disciples, and uh, I've invested in some high level uh, ministry uh, gifts to come in and help spend time with my church as we are preparing for the next season and the next phase of our development. Guys, listen. All Nations Worship Assembly will be 12 years old this year. All Nations will be 12 years old, and the World Changers Summit will be 10 years old. So I'm really excited. This is a critical year, and um, I like to invest in, in gifts to come in to help us be better at what we're doing because we're getting ready for the next um, phase. Hey, Adrian Davis, we can make a whole show right there. I'm going I'm to behave until after Tuesday, so... Then we can get ignorant. Aaron Bailey, hey man, how you doing? So, um, yeah, um, it's a very significant year for us, and God is doing a lot of things with us. So we got some good people coming in. Prophet Kevin Leal. If you don't know who Kevin Leal is, you need to Google him. Uh, I mean, he's a man of God who is strictly uh, called to the local church, and uh, he's an amazing, amazing ministry gift. I've got some other people coming in. I may even uh make some more phone calls see if i can get some people come and help us good do your homework so but i've been talking about lust um and i've been dealing with the subject of sexual character because it's very important to me um i'm a deliverance man and and uh because i'm a deliverance man i am a destiny man and when you cast out demons hey overseer morris love you when you cast out devils you do it unto destiny. I think that we started to teaching uh, that we cast out devils unto freedom. But what good is freedom without a focus? Mm. Even your freedom needs a focus. Jesus Christ does not just want you free for the sake of freedom. He wants you free for the sake of a future. I want all of you to grasp that. This is why I push deliverance and freedom so hard. It's not just so that you could have a better quality of life but it's or peace of mind. It's so that you could have the type of life God called you to have. So being a deliverance guy, um, I think that we need to start uh, to prepare ourselves to understand the point God's vision for deliverance and for the setting free of captives. And um, the reason that God sets captives free is unto the work he called them to do. So that's important. Freedom without a focus may be frivolous. 
you may not really get the full benefits of freedom if you don't know an assignment and if you don't know a purpose and if you don't understand why God is emphatically insistent and committed to making you free. But he wants you free for your future. I want all of us to begin there. Deliverance has a point. Freedom has a point. All of that has a point, and it's not just so that you can finally wipe the sweat off your brow and say you're free. No, you are free to achieve. You are free to accomplish. You are free to exhale. You are free to have an assignment. So that's very important that you realize there is a point to freedom. If you're following me already, I want you to write that down as you're taking notes. There is a point to freedom. Go ahead. Write that down because I want you to get that good and in your spirit. There is a point to freedom. I think that one of the ways we became lawless is that we preach to freedom without a point. And a freedom without a point is lawlessness. It's I do what I want. I'm governed by myself. But freedom has a point. And once we get to the point of freedom, then we can prosper. Okay? So I want you to understand that. I am a, a deliverance guy. I love casting out devils. Um, the, the lady that discipled my wife into salvation used to say a term, bust the devil's head open to the white meat. And uh, I enjoy doing that very literally, busting the devil's head to the white meat. Twelve years ago when we started our church, I made a couple of commitments to God. And one of the commitments I made to God was that I would always work my own altar. Sophia Ruffin, bless you, woman of God, I would always work my own altars. Now, because I'm a multiplier, I raise up everybody to do it. But I'm never going to send a, a representative to, to work my altars. I work my own altars. Uh, and uh, but I believe in, in, in the power of the altar and, and the anointing upon my church and my life uh, flows from the altar. So I believe that there are times and there are moments and there are issues. There are things that God addresses and exchanges at an altar. Uh, and so we are an altar church. We are an altar people. We are my network. I, I take them to, I don't care how contemporary or new school we get, there are certain things that I refuse to negotiate about. And one of them is the, the immutable, irrefutable, undeniable demonstration of the power of God as by the hands of the men and the women of God that lead these moves. Uh, and so um, even though it's been 12 years of pastoring, I, I still feel like I've only opened um, chapter one of my story. And so what I'm about to share with you is some of the things I've learned in chapter one. Hey, Timotheus, my, my beloved, I love you. Uh, and so a part of what I have known and a part of what I've been groomed to do is minister to, prophesy to, father, emancipate, deal with, confront, heal, restore, redeem, resuscitate captives, slaves, prisoners and dead men and there has been probably no more consistent issue of the dead or the dying as I have seen it um, than the issue if it's not a chemical addiction it's a sexual addiction um, they probably have to be up there with the top three issues I've seen people deal with uh, and particularly church people unbelievers aren't obvious but the reason why I think it's so prevalent in church people is because the issue of sex and sexuality is so blatantly ignored and so blatantly uh, overlooked and so blatantly preached around, danced over, ran through, etc. So because somehow we thought that if we taught sex and sexuality uh, from a theological perspective and from God's mind, that it would somehow open up the explorations of people that hear it, we avoided the subject matter altogether. And you see what that got us? A generation of drag queens, a generation of molested men, a generation of freaky preachers with collar, collars on, a generation of, of, of priests that molest people, a generation of church members uh, who are all related to each other legitimately and don't know how. It's because we never sat down and laid a foundation in men's lives for how to approach sexuality, how to approach sexuality in sanctification, 
and what you're being sanctified and how it affects your sexual preferences, ideas, ideals, and character. So that's very important that you realize. So this is a, a very important subject to me. Uh, and I think that if we're going to have the generate uh, the audacity to talk about revival, we have got to include the casting out of devils because the casting out of devils was an earmark of the revival ministry of the man Jesus Christ. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, one of my first disciples had a sexual character problem and, 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 and probably hundreds of thousands of them around the world uh, have sexual character issues. But I have studied this. Uh, my wife was probably a little more actively engaged in this form of ministry pragmatism than I was. But as a byproduct of being somebody who is a house of war uh, and byproduct of even being prophetic, you run into... Uh, demonic entrapments in people's hearts and many of them are sexual in nature. Satan knows the power of sexuality. The Bible says for this cause a man shall leave his wife and be leave his mother and father and be joined uh, to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Now that becoming one flesh um, many times people look at it as if it's a mutual decision. Hey, I'm me, you're you, let's go ahead and be one. No, that is a communication of the sexual power that happens when the two join and join routinely in sex and sexuality. There ends up becoming a fusing and a joining of two people's lives, stories. That's right, it's also referred to as a soul tie, the two becoming one. And so because of the fusing power, the bonding power, and uh, the the adhesive potential uh, of sex and sexual experiences, Satan uses sex, sexuality, sexual exposure for expedience sake to accelerate and catalyze demonic attacks on the lives of generations. Now, it's going to arrive on the life of one person, but the ultimate assault is aimed to that person's seed. I have a saying in deliverance, and it's this: when the adults play, the children when the adults play, the children pay. When the adults play, the children pay. Often, when you are being prematurely and unrighteously exposed to sex and sexuality, what it's doing is it's creating certain habits desires, appetites in you to affect and to alter the quality of life you can build to ultimately attack and assault your seed. That's important for you to realize. Many of us are how we are today because of immature, bad, unrighteous, uh, or heinous sexual decisions on the behalf of those before us. And so you've got to realize how significant that that is. Uh, so unfortunately, if you are saved, your sex sexuality and sexual behavior is not your business <laughs> it is the business of god all that to really just lay a, a foundation on how important your sexuality is to your spirituality and you can't really talk about spirituality void from uh sexuality uh because sexuality is one of the ways that spirituality is affected and assaulted and uh one of the common ways that uh sexuality is introduced to people if not by playing house as a child, if not by music or some form of video, um, if not by a birds and the bees discussion by a husband or a wife, one of the most primary ways sexuality is in introduced to people is through the vehicle of pornography. The vehicle of pornography. Um, and this is something that we must talk about. If you want to see how bound your church is with the demon, the pornographic spirit. Talk about it and see and perceive the holy hush that cometh in the room. There's going to be a the hush so strong that you can you can see hear church mouses shouting on cotton. It would be so quiet. Porn is a very powerful instrument to introduce sexuality and sexual appetite into the life of a person. Now, there is a scripture, two of them I'm going to give you as we walk through this, but one of them talks about awaking 
or arousing love before its time. The Bible says, do not awake love before its time. Now, obviously, that cannot be referring to an agape love because an agape love uh, is something that God calls us into from the moment we are saved, from the moment we are submitted. That's right, it's the Song of Solomon. From the moment we are filled with the Holy Ghost, our challenge, our goal, our vision, our desire is to grow in the agape love of God towards His truth, number one, towards His people, number two. And um, so certainly that can't necessarily be what God is timing to wake up in our lives. It couldn't be the agape love, but it has to be the phileo or the erotic type of love, the eros love. One of the words for love is eros, and it is normatively romantic and passionate, and in some cases, pornographic in nature. So we've got to talk about porn, and we've got to talk about its agenda, because porn has an agenda. Can you type that if you're following me right now? Pornography has an agenda. And the Bible uh, says that don't awake love before it's time. And premature introduction or introduction to porn, period, is the awakening of a desire prior to its time. Porn has an agenda. We've got to decipher the agenda of pornography. Whether you are heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, trisexual, asexual, whatever your particular designation may be. But porn has an agenda. And a part of the agenda of pornography is to cause darkness to enter your body. That is the vision of the pornographic agenda. That is the objective. If I was on the porn team in hell and we were having a strategy meeting about how to effectively ruin fathers, ruin families, turn people's sexuality out towards them. The vision of our meeting, the, a win for us would be to cause darkness to enter the body. Darkness to enter the body. Darkness needs an access point into your body. Watch this many times after you've made a profession of salvation. And I'm going to give you scripture to support what I'm talking about. Once you remove yourself from the powers of darkness and Satan is no longer your God and the rivals of God are no longer your uh, uh, the focus of your personal devotion and allegiance, then Satan has to find access points to make sure that he can remain an active source of information and an active source of inspiration in your body. So we're not just talking about cancer. We're not just talking about diabetes. We're not just talking about arthritis. We're talking about the instrument and the vehicle of porn and what it brings into your body. Now, you may see porn as an event, you know, something that you kind of sit down and do or lay down and do or whatever, but you never really think to discern or be aware of the presentation of pornography and what it's offering you. And it's beyond a sexual feeling and a, a, a sexual arrival point unto pleasure. It brings, somebody just called me, God is gripping my heart so strongly lately about the subject of discipleship because I really, really, really believe it's under attack. Uh, and uh, there are some of these things, you know, hell knows the power of recruitment. And um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm grieved about the absence of discipleship in the urban church. And I think it's important for everybody to have people in your life and in your world that can show you how to be a real Christian. I have a message I'm working on called Lord, Make Me a Christian, because I believe a lot of people made a profession of faith, but never learned how to live like him. And I believe God is in the mood to make people Christians because we're not living like it and uh, we're not being trained in it. We're not being escorted into it. We're not being given an example. You know, I discipleship is so important, but it's a lost art in the inner city church. We just want to dance. But, uh, you know, I just don't know if people are discipling and I don't know if people's deliverance is being maintained because of the absence of a discipleship culture in the average church. Let me just do some 
um, some research real quick. It's kind of dark. Hold on. All this talk, talking about darkness and light has me irritated with darkness. So I want, I want some light right now. God said, let there be. Let me ask you a question really quickly. And I want you to respond with an emoji to help me know if I'm going the right direction for my next series. If you were saved or delivered or introduced to your calling by the avenue of either one-on-one -on -one or uh, uh, a cohort discipleship, give me a thumbs up. If you were saved or if you experienced deliverance or if you were introduced to the gifts of the spirit or your personal calling by discipleship, give me a thumbs up. Apostle Mayberry, I see you firstborn. Good. Naomi Faith, you were not. Tehillah, you were. Ray Nelson, you were. Nupi, you were. CMD 1992, you were. AP I see them hands. Come on. A cohort discipleship is when it's like t five to 12. Good. I want to see if I'm going in the right direction. I'm working on a new series. Sam Steve, no. 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 Sophia Ruffin, yes. So Sophia Ruffin, a part of your story is somebody snatched you when they did and pulled you. Is that a part of your story? Let me know. I'm getting more no's than yeses. Okay, Charity Songs is one on one. T. Dubia says no. Wow, Denise Stephanie. Yeah, I'm definitely, B. Miguel is no. Somebody says, I received a prophetic word on it. Yeah, see, this is a problem. This is a problem. This is a problem because, again, this is one of the things Jesus told us to do was go to the world and make disciples. And, and all we're doing is making babies. It's unfortunate that people are not making disciples. I, uh, Monday night, one of my friends uh, was in town, Dr. Jamal Bryant. And that guy is somebody I love with my heart. Um, I personally think he's one of the greatest preachers in America, in my opinion. And um, so he was in town. And um, when he was in town, he was going to preach at St. James Church of God in Christ uh, with Bishop Willie Campbell, who's another preaching giant in my city. And um, I went Monday night and surprised he and Bishop uh, to 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 hear him preach because when he's in town I like to be in his space and when he's in my town he likes to be in mine with you know like friends do so I went and I sat there to listen to him preach but before I heard him preach my other close friend Pastor John Hanna was up and John Hanna was taking the offering I want you to hear this because it brought tears to my eyes John Hanna was taking the offering and John Hanna who came out of Bishop Campbell's church, started talking to Bishop Campbell about all he learned from Bishop Campbell. Now, I was waiting to hear something about carrying water or you sitting with me, and those things are good and important. But John Hanna started saying stuff like, Willie Campbell and, and Bishop Campbell's face just flooded with tears. He, he told Bishop Campbell, he said, it was you that took me downtown to buy me my first suit. You taught me how to tie my tie. You showed me how to get cufflinks. You taught me how to match my clothes. You taught me how to submit an itinerary to, uh, to a preacher. And you, when I, when he said, when I was a cogent guy and I didn't know how to, how to squall and I didn't have a hoop, you taught me how to walk in my own anointing and didn't pressure me to be like you. You taught me how to get a job and love my wife. And I was sitting there, sitting on the front row like this, and I'm normally not in gatherings like this, but I was sitting there just so perplexed at how unique and how powerful that story was that however many years ago, he had a real story where somebody snatched him, pulled him up on their lives and said, let me show you the way to not just ministry, but to destiny, to life. I was wrecked, man. I didn't need to, I mean, my boy preached his face off, but that was was a lot for me. And I think all of us were so touched by it because we were like, whoa, people really do that. I mean, that really exists. So it blessed me, you know, because it was it wasn't just about book recommendations and it wasn't just about uh, uh, sitting with me and any of that stuff. It was or sitting on the it was what Pastor Hannah 
honored Bishop Campbell about was for teaching him how to be a man that was called to ministry. And the types of lessons that Pastor Campbell gave him were stuff that was so vital. Now, the problem is, I know it's about porn, but here the problem is we are in a generation of people that are so intoxicated with talent that they don't want to take the time to be disciple. They are so in love with their own potential and they are so in love with their own opportunity and they are so in love with being desirous of waiting on their turn and waiting on their time and waiting on their moment that they don't want to take the time to actually be discipled and so I had the thought I was sitting there like, whoa, if this guy would have never have snatched him when he did, who knows if my city would be, would be being blessed by him. That blessed me. So one of the reasons why this porn discussion even needs to be had is because of the absence of small group discipleship opportunities where somebody can make direct questions about where you are, what in your life is interfering with your salvation, what is active in your thought processes, how you, when he started talking about how Bishop Campbell taught him how to go to work to be a man and provide for his wife, I was like, look, I'm just done. I, it's just, it just doesn't really exist. So among other things, you know, I'm committed to reviving that culture because I believe it's the way God's going to build an army. God cannot build an army unless he raises up recruiters. Glory to God. And we have been talking about becoming the army of the Lord in the Black Pentecostal Church for years. And we've been lying because we ain't got recruiters unto righteousness. We have recruiters for organs and, 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 and choir director, but nobody wants to take people out to dinner and ask, what's your bondage? <laughs> Where have you been? Where, what have you walked through? What's walked through you? How can I attach myself to you to do everything in my power to see that you succeed? It's just rare. So I'm going to try to open that culture back up and um, revive it because it's so important. It's so important. It's so important. So these are the woes of pornography. If you are a man, a woman, uh, any of that, and you are uh, having a porn issue and a porn challenge, you want to sever your life and remove yourself from the hold of porn and from the hold of lust and uh, the hold of the control and the intoxication of the demon of porn. Now, let's say you you don't watch porn and you're like, mm -mm, but you're an occasional fornicator. I've got great news for you, Mrs. Fornicator, Mr. Fornicator. The Greek word for fornication is pornea. P-O-R-N-E-A. Isn't that nice to know? So yeah, if you do an occasional slip trip with your baby daddy or a slip trip after a night at the club or a slip trip with a random person, you too are a porn addict. You just go from uh, 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 1D to 3D. So instead of thinking about it, you actually do it, but you're still a slave. Praise the God of the Bible. Isn't that nice to know? So you want me to turn my plow, but I'm not going to do it. I believe it's a season of deliverance, and I believe God is trying to catechize some people for the point of destiny. So that's very important. Yo, I'm out. I've got to uh, go and uh, <laughs> um, clean my room and put some stuff in, uh, in the cleaners. You know, I've got some awesome things planned, but I love you guys so much. Um, enjoy this scope and... Uh, Review it, share it, watch it, and, and do me a favor, will you? I need all of you to do me a favor. Get out of these dead churches and find you a place of deliverance. Will you do that for me? All right. Thank you.